Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, good day to uh, those of you joining us virtually uh, from different time zones around the world. Uh, my name is Meke Okeke. I'm the lead counsel for global knowledge and research here at the World Bank. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Law, Justice, and Development LJD Week 2023. Uh, on behalf of the organizing team of this event. This is the 13th edition of the annual LJD Week and the first to be held in person since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you already know, the theme of this year's event is Partnering for Impact, Enabling and Mobilizing the Private Sector for Sustainable Development. As the saying goes, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go with someone. The issue is no longer whether international development partners, such as the public sector, multilateral development banks, international financial institutions, and the private sector should partner, but how they should partner. The goal of this conference is therefore not only to discuss ideas, but also to discuss how to implement those ideas. We are very excited about these three days of sharing knowledge, exchanging ideas, and fostering partnerships. As you will see from the agenda, the format of this year's event is a bit different. In the past, we used to have two or three parallel sessions which meant that a good many of you could not attend some of the sessions of interest because they could not be at two or three places at the same time. This year, we have made sure that no one will have to deal with such a trilemma or dilemma. Instead of parallel sessions, we will have only plenary sessions. We hope you will enjoy the sessions. Um, one important housekeeping note because of the hybrid nature of this uh, event, uh, we intend to start on time for every session because people will be joining us uh, virtually. Another is that uh, the, for fire and safety reasons, uh, no one should be standing around this room. We have uh, an overflow room, MC2800, and we have colleagues around that might take you there uh, when we have an overflow. Uh, to kick off the event, I'm very pleased to introduce the host of LJD Week 2023, Chris Stevens, Senior Vice President and Group General Counsel of the World Bank, uh, to give his opening remarks. Chris, the podium is all yours. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. And it's my great pleasure on behalf of the World Bank Group to welcome all of you to the LJD Week 2023. We've worked together with our colleagues across the World Bank, our development partners, international organizations, academics, civil society, and the private sector to deliver to you some of the most prominent thinkers, leaders, and doers in international development. We'll discuss with you some of the challenges faced and the urgencies faced by the world in the development agenda these days particularly as they result from pandemic crises and uh, the, the, the particular needs of countries and vulnerable uh, people. The renewed mission of the World Bank is the eradication of poverty on a livable planet. We're enhancing our financial capacity to deliver more and better results, outcomes, solutions, and to do so at scale. We're thinking more broadly to support the strengthening of national systems and policies and capacity to meet the de sustainable development goals, as well as the challenges brought on by economic uh, uh, strains, pandemics, food crises, and the challenges of fragility, violence, and conflict. We'll try to produce better and more effective and, and, and resilient outcomes working together with partners like all of you. As partners, it's critical, as Meke indicated, that we, we identify solutions together 
and harness our collective resources and knowledge and energies and deliver better, more coordinated, and ultimately more effective results on the ground. Throughout our discussions, we'll be emphasizing the role of the rule of law in development. The rule of law as an ecosystem of legislation and laws and the institutions of the regulators and judiciaries that can implement and apply those laws and regulations fairly, effectively, predictably, transparently, and ethically. The role of law as an indispensable part of the development agenda and the critical link between the policy agenda and the policy dialogue and the results on the ground. We'll be focusing from the outside in to deliver more effective solutions identified by our client countries and private sector partners in the achievement of their goals and our common objectives. This effort is going to require trillions of dollars of investment, well beyond the capacity of our enhanced financial capacity and all of the official development assistance that our generous members might provide. It's going, to prov it's going to require a substantially scaled up engagement and investment of the private sector, which is why we have themed this conference, Partnering for Impact, the Enabling and Engagement of the Private Sector in the Development Agenda. We'll consider how laws and regulatory frameworks will facilitate the development agenda and the engagement of the private sector by creating that predictability and minimizing the risk of private sector investment. We'll discuss how judiciaries and regulatory agencies can improve their efficiency and effectiveness to apply laws and regulations more efficiently in order to instill investor confidence, reduce risk, and facilitate that investment. And we'll, dis and we'll discuss the role of MDBs, international organizations, and our other development partners on their role in enhancing the rule of law in development. So we look forward to working with you these, over these next few days on the exchange of ideas and hope we'll inspire some dialogue and, and further solutions that we might effect together to deliver on our vital mission to eradicate poverty on a livable planet. I'm also honored to be able to turn things over now to our next segment on the exchange of ideas between World Bank President Ajay Banga and our Deputy General Counsel Sheila Musimi who is uh, remotely, uh, I think Ajay is on his way to Singapore, but he wanted to make sure that he could participate in kicking off this event so that we can frame our discussions around some of the critical ideas on the multi-development landscape today. So Ajay joins us from New York, and Sheila is in the, uh, uh, over at the studio. Thank you both for joining us. President Banga, thank you. And Sheila, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Sheila Brakamusime, and I'm delighted to welcome Ajay to a conversation on unlocking private finance for the future. Our time is short, and we have a lot of ground to cover. So let me ask you the first question, Ajay. Let's talk about the current landscape. Your six months in this job, how would you characterize the broader context in which the World Bank is operating? What do you see as the main challenges the World Bank must address? Yes, thank you very much, Sheila. And I'm sorry I can't be with you all in person, but I am headed off to Singapore, as Chris just mentioned. Uh, the, um, the question's a great one. I would say from the time that I became a nominee and started traveling, I had a chance to visit about 93 different sets of countries in different ways and met civil society and some asset managers and, uh, and operators in various parts in the private sector. And between then and now, all that those meetings have led to a clarity around two or three things. And the first one is that we don't have the luxury of dealing with you know, separate little neat compartmentalized boxes of problems. Uh, thinking that we can solve poverty separately from shared prosperity separately from climate change, separately from fragility, conflict, and violence, separately from food insecurity, 
separately from pandemics. These don't unfortunately operate in separate neat boxes. And so the intertwined nature of these crises where they feed off each other, and you can see that happening and unfolding even now in the tragic war in the Middle East. You saw that over the last couple of years with the war in Ukraine and all the conflicts in Africa that have been going on for a while, the pandemic, climate issues, water availability, these are all intertwined with poverty. And trying to segregate them is not going to work easily. And therefore, uh, you have to amend the vision of the bank to not only focus on poverty and, and sharing prosperity, but on getting engaged and involved with the intertwined nature of these crises. That's kind of one big first uh, learning. The second one has been the, the sort of growing mistrust, and I use that word carefully, between the global south and the global north. And what I mean by that is that the developing world uh, feels that the manner in which development has worked thus far is now the the consequences of that of that heavy emissions heavy growth is now being borne by them those who contribute the least to it being one example but then they also feel that the rules of energy access don't apply equally to them so if you were to go to africa and there are 600 million people without any form of energy access and there's over a billion people in the world and a half close to it with intermittent forms of energy access then they feel that being told that they cannot use natural gas as a transition to getting energy is a challenge for them. Now, remember, there's there's good arguments on both sides. I'm, I'm not getting into that right now. I'm just telling you what I saw and heard. And then, of course, they feel that the reconstruction of Ukraine, when it does come about, as well as now, for that matter, what will be required is a heavy injection of capital into Palestine and Gaza one day when this war comes to an end. All this will take away from their ability to do the right thing for their citizens. And so there is a fear and a concern that they will not get a chance or a fair shake at the till kind of thing. So that leads to a growing distrust and a, and a gap between them. And I think what I'm seeing the bank as an institution do and need to do is its role is even more critical. It cannot do it alone. But because there's not enough money in you know, the bank's coffers or in the coffers of governments, so you need the right partnerships and so on. But at the end of the day, we are dealing with a far more complicated world with these crises that are intertwined and with this mistrust than we were in the past. That, to me, is the real context setting. You know, Ajay, uh, you were clearly mindful of this dynamic when you walked into the bank. Um, these intertwined challenges, the, the mistrust between the global north and the global south. And, and one of the first things that you did was to try and reorient this 78-year-old institution with a new vision uh, statement. Uh, and this is to create a world free of poverty on a livable planet. And I, I do hope all our guests in, in the room who are from several um, multilateral development banks, IFIs, government, have walked through our, our, our front door and see this new vision and mission um, right there, uh, which inspires us, us each day to remember what we are working towards. But what are you trying to achieve with this new um, mission and vision? I think the first thing is that to move past poverty and not forget that eradicating poverty, eradicating inequality is kind of a mission critical issue for humanity. Forget just the bank, for all of us. Everybody deserves a fair opportunity in their life to lead it to the fullness of what they are capable of. And to me, therefore, you can't get away from that issue of inequality. You know, inequality to me is a, uh, is a problem that gets manifested in education, in health access, in financial access and opportunity. But inequality is reflected in the way genders are treated. It's reflected in the way ethnicity is handled. It's reflected in the way religious differences, sexual orientation differences, or frankly, just your bad luck to be born on the wrong side of the tracks are handled. And to me, therefore, inequality has to be worked really hard on. And that's why the eradication of poverty 
is part of the first part of that vision. The problem, as I said, is you can't do that without the other intertwined challenges. And the idea of introducing livable planet is that if you cannot breathe clean air, if you cannot drink clean water, what kind of a life do you actually have? If you basically spend your life on the run as a refugee, today refugees are in a refugee mindset on the average for 16 years at a time. From the time they start thinking of leaving their home to take dangerous journeys to go elsewhere and live a life that is still very difficult to the time they actually settle down on the average is 16 years. That's a lifetime. You will have children, parents will die, kids will go to school. A whole life goes by in those 16 years. If you're unsettled for those 16 years, that's not a productive individual in society. It's really hard for them. And so I think you have to realize the fact that livable planet, meaning a planet that is worth living in, that gives people the right of a good life, is very important. That's the idea of merging those two into one vision statement so we can expand the aperture by which the bank looks at a challenge and then tries to organize itself to actually fight those challenges in this fuller holistic context. That's the first thing. The second thing we've done is to specifically incorporate the needs of women and young people. That does not mean that we don't appreciate other smaller marginalized issues and communities. Don't get me wrong, they're all important. Remember, we start with removing inequality caused by different uh, biases. But, but the fact of picking women, first of all, is half the population is women. And the reality of even the developed world is that women do not get all the opportunities that they deserve to get. In fact, I would argue that if they were to get, they would make the world a better place. And therefore, to me, trying to ignore that in the developing world is actually not an appropriate thing to do. And I want to bring the cause of giving women the right and opportunity to win and succeed and lead good lives, an important women and girls, therefore, an important part of our mission. And the second part of that is young people. The Global South, which is where we are focused in terms of our developmental efforts, has a very large percentage of its population in young people. And the world often speaks to that as a demographic dividend in the sense that, you know, as that goes through the pipe, it will lead to greater productivity, greater jobs, and so on and so forth. And that only works if these young people actually have quality of life when they're growing up, meaning clean air, clean water, education, health, that kind of thing. And then once they're grown up, they must get access to jobs. Jobs are what gives them dignity. Jobs are what give them a desire to live and work every day. And jobs are what keep them socially correctly active. If you don't do that, you run the risk of demographic challenges, not demographic dividends. And so in our revised vision and mission, we're trying to broaden the aperture to include the idea of a livable planet beyond poverty and inequality. But we're also trying to ensure that women and young people get the right focus from the bank and its efforts. Now, all those really resonate, and these are issues we are hoping to cover over the next few days to try and unpack what how that means in the whole rule of law um, sector. But just going back to um, what you've been talking about for the last few months, um, and particularly at the annual meetings uh, in, in the brilliant speech that you gave, um, you talked about a better bank, right? To be able to deliver on this, you talked about a better bank. Uh, you, you talked about uh, fixing the plumbing uh, and I think all you know all those in the room who work for governments or who work for MDBs can kind of identify with that but I just want to drill down a little bit what what does that mean for us here at the World Bank how how do you see that and how do you see that fixing the plumbing contributing to driving change so the idea of the better bank and fixing the plumbing is all intertwined in in uh, in my way of thinking these challenges are now so big and so complex that all of us in this room, multilateral banks, governments, private sector, we're going to have to play at the top of our game if we're going to be able to move the needle on the level of issues they are facing. And I have optimism about it, don't get me wrong. I believe it can be done, but I believe it has to be done the right way. 
And one of the first things you have to do is to make sure that the bank, the World Bank, operates in the best possible way that it can. And what I mean by that is everything ranging from efficiency and effectiveness, meaning, you know, it takes us 27 months on the average from the time a project starts getting worked upon to the time that the first dollar gets dispersed. It could take up to 10 years, of course, for a project to be fully active and its full results and outcomes to be visible. But in those 27 months at the beginning, there are many steps that we've got to look at again and see whether we, in collaboration with the governments we're working with, and the other partners we're working with, can we reduce that time frame by just a third to start with. It's harder in some cases from the time the project is approved to the time the first dollar goes, because there you've got governments and parliaments involved. But that doesn't mean that it's a topic we must not take on. We must. Because at the end of the day, development delayed is development denied. And 27 months is a very long time. And so trying to get that to work better by operating differently ourselves is the first starting point of this. A second point in there is the, out, the idea of outcomes rather than input. So yes, we need to measure dollars dispersed and number of projects financed in different things. But I think outcomes, as in number of girls who went to school, people who got a better job because of a skilling institute we helped to open, or the area around the bus rapid transit system that developed better because of that BRT, or carbon emissions avoided, that kind of thing to me is equally important and therefore losing sight of the outcome measurement would not be a good move and i want to get us to that along with the other mdbs and a number of things that are in the process on that front a third topic of that type has to do with partnerships you know I, as i said right at the beginning i don't think there's enough money or effort that can be done out of just us or the other mdbs or governments we need the private sector, we need its energy, we need its capital, we need its innovation, we need its people, its technology to come to the party, particularly when there is a rational business model that they can work upon. Can the World Bank and other institutions help to reduce some of the risk that they are not, that the private sector is not trained to handle or incapable of factoring into their way of thinking about their return on capital? things that are outside of their control in such a way that prevents them from investing in these markets, even when the technology and scale is ready. And so getting to that and trying to see ourselves as the builder of the rail track on which the private sector can run a railroad is kind of important. And so thinking of these various steps on how we can be better partners with our other multilateral development banks, the kind of thing we're doing with the Inter-American Development Bank with Ilan, or with the African, or with the uh, uh, Islamic Development Bank, and hopefully soon the African Development Bank, the AIIB. These are all partners whom we need to work much closer with. And I think the last part I'd touch on is the knowledge bank. I believe our institution is both a money bank and a knowledge bank. A lot of countries really appreciate us not just for the money we provide. That's important, particularly if you're a poorer country. The IDA grants and concessional financing longer term financing is very helpful. But the reality is we are a knowledge bank as well. And I think we're gonna organize our knowledge bank into these verticals of people, prosperity, planet, infrastructure, and digital. And these will then apply across where we work. And we'll measure outcomes across all of these and put that into our revised corporate scorecard. Our current corporate scorecard has 153 items in it. And Anybody in the private sector will tell you that that's about 130 too many. So we're going to try and come down to 20 odd so we can actually focus on outcomes in that corporate scorecard that come from these five knowledge verticals, working closely and tightly with the implementation teams in the field, whether they be IDA, IBRD, IFC, or MEGA or exit teams. And that's the kind of vision of the World Bank F, if it's better bank, that I want to get out there. The reason I talk about plumbing and then I'm going to stop discussing this, is that the, the only way to explain that to people is that what I don't want to do is to build another house on top of a dysfunctional plumbing, meaning plumbing which is either leaking or the taps don't work or the pipes are not working. 
you've got to fix that because you fix it well and you can build an amazing house on top of these. And I want to make sure that some of the inefficiencies and ineffectiveness that has crept into our system and across the multilateral system is engaged in and discussed and tried to be fixed so we can make ourselves all much more uh, purpose fit for these challenges that we're discussing. It's great, and it just segues right into what we're trying to do this, this week, Ajay. This conference that we've convened is really about partnering for impact. Uh, it's, it's about enabling and mobilizing the private sector. And so we also have in the room private sector uh, partners, general counsels from different private sector um, uh, companies uh, uh, and entities. And so I just want to segue into to that and to keep your thoughts flowing on, on this whole um, topic of partnering and, and, and the private sector. So you've talked about the challenges that are immense, climate change, uh, poverty, inequality, fragility, and you know, analysts have put a cost to this and they're talking about a trillion US dollars, right? And, and that's a trillion each and every year. It, it, it sounds mind boggling. And, and it's, it's really clear that, um, you know, we can't do this alone and you have big plans obviously as and we are all with you in this um, and, and to, to make, make sure that development in emerging markets can can happen um, but really Ajay our balance sheet is limited and you're the first to to acknowledge that we'll need help from the private sector as we will from uh, other public sector institutions and and so really it's um critical that we align ourselves to what the private sector wants. And you've come from a private sector background and you know what that can look like. And so I'm, I want you to try and help us as we get into this week to, to try and see how we can maximize the impact of all these initiatives that we are starting together as, as the World Bank. How can we bring together the private sector and align them with this vision and mission? Yes, I would, first of all, I want to make sure that you don't get the impression that it's only about the private sector. I think they're a key part of this. And that I, we don't end up with thinking that the trillions that are required for everything, which are numbers put out by various bodies, should not frighten us. Uh, because I think that leads to the wrong answers. First of all, not everything requires trillions. To give you an example in climate, to me, methane is a very big issue. And methane, the emissions of methane from, say, farming from rice paddy can be altered fairly substantially. Close to 8 or 9% of methane emissions in the world come from that. And that can be reduced by 40 odd percent by following different uh, rice growing practices, which require less amount of water to be flooding the field all the time through the period you need periodic irrigation and so on. These are not as expensive as, say, setting up capacity in solar and wind energy, which is where the trillions start being spoken about. I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that many things can be done with lower resources as well, and they must be done, and we shouldn't only focus on the big dollars and the big zeros at the end of every number. It's kind of important. The second part is I do not believe that this institution can be a good partner for the private sector and MD, other MDBs without also becoming a bigger bank once we get through the better bank stage. These are kind of very interconnected and important issues. And the bigger bank not only requires adequacy of capital from its current things that we're doing with hybrid and portfolio guarantees and the like, but eventually will require capital increases. We are finally the voice of the ambition of our shareholders. And, and uh, the ambition of our shareholders needs to be reflected in the way in which the bank gets capitalized for the challenges we see ahead, even to be a good partner for the private sector to help manage some of the risks, whether political risks or foreign exchange risks or other risks that they feel are outside their ambit of influence. Even to do that would require us to have a stronger balance sheet than we would have today to meet the aspirations they have. So I think both these points are important. Don't only think of dollars and don't only think of the private sector. Think also of us becoming a bigger bank and chat tackling the things that don't always require large sums of money. Now, the point about, uh, about lots of sources of money as well. 
There's subsidies we could look at. There's a trillion plus dollars of subsidies that go out into the world every year on fossil fuels and agriculture and fisheries. And if you look at the harmful environmental impact of some of those, it adds up to six or trillion in a year. That's $7.25 trillion a year. I'm not saying you divert all of that. A lot of those subsidies are very important for people at the lower end of the spectrum on earnings. So don't do that. But you can repurpose them. The European Union repurposed 60 billion of the subsidies that used to go into incremental fertilizer use with all the drain off and problems associated. The same 60 billion goes to farmers to encourage them to reduce fertilizer. use. That's an intelligent way to repurpose subsidies in a smart way to change behavior and to change environmental impact. So there's many ways to think about subsidies. The wrong way to think about them is we can't change them. In the same way, there is much we can do with voluntary carbon markets. Yes, there's criticism about greenwashing and the like. That is fair. We need to do it better. But not doing it is also not an answer. Because eventually, hoping that somehow taxes will work, where rich countries will tax their citizens to send money to the global south far away to change something there, is not a likely circumstance in democracies. And therefore, we're going to have to find a way to create voluntary movements of money. One of the best ways of doing that is to continue to invest in voluntary carbon markets and ensure that they're done in a way that avoids criticism and, in fact, is seen as constructive over the years to come. Backing away from them, being scared of doing them, would also be a mistake. Doing them the right way and improving all the time is the only correct way to approach that topic. So all those are important. And then there's the role of the private sector, which I know is what you want to get to. To me, that role is really important, as I said, most private sector investors, right now, if you ask someone, are you willing to invest in renewable energy projects in Indonesia, there would be enough private sector investors, operators, as well as long-term asset managers, who would consider that to be a relatively attractive thing to do. Solar and wind and geothermal and the like have now got proven technology and proven technology at scale, where the per unit cost of these technologies is lower than the per unit cost of fossil fuels. Yes, there is a longer gestation period, a higher capital investment, and a time period required before those lines cross over. So the question is, can we reduce some of the risks that hold the private sector back from investing in that particular country to change and bend the arc of emissions and emission-heavy growth in the future? And I think there you come to political risk and regulatory risk. So the first question there is, does the country have a clear roadmap on where it's going with renewable energy? A 10-year roadmap gives a lot of reassurance to investors. They understand it might change, but it shows vision and a purpose. You combine that, therefore, with the right regulatory policies on the ground that relate with tariff policy or the policy around those energies and the policy around transmission and distribution. Once you lay those out with the right approach for an investor to feel that there are legal protections in place to enable them to get the right recourse in the event of challenges, that changes a lot. And even then, they may have political risk attached to it. That's what MEGA and the MEGA guarantee system can help to do. Then there is the issue of foreign exchange risk, which is still a very difficult one. The, you know, If you're investing in dollars, euros, and yen, and your repayment in terms of being paid by utility, I'm still on renewable energy, is in local currency, clearly there is an issue there for you to hedge. Some countries, those hedges are available. In other countries, neither the depth nor width of the hedging market of those currencies is adequate to do so. So the question is, can we help create something which could help do that? TCX does some of this in frontier markets, but can TCX also expand its scale and size into other markets? And then how do you fund it? What do you fund it from? What should philanthropy dollars be contributing to? What should MDB dollars go to? What should government dollars go to? All of this aimed at not giving the private sector outsized returns, but taking away the risk that they do not know how to manage because it's outside their ability to influence, control, operationalize, or succeed with. That's the kind of thing we need to get our head and mind wrapped around. That's what our private sector lab is trying to do. That's what IFC has been trying to do. We have much more to do together with others like IDB Invest and the like, but there's a lot of work to be done in this space. Clearly a lot of work. And I think all through that response, it's really about partnerships. 
private sector can't alone, we can't alone, it, governments can't alone. So it's really, really about partnerships. So let me bring it to the legal community, Ajay. Um, uh, we have a lot uh, of, of colleagues from the legal community here in this room today. And um, I just want you to share some reflections on, on the role of the rule of law. How can it help us in this endeavor? Yeah, well, listen, this whole idea of regulatory policy and of clarity on the rule of what and how an investor knows what they're signing up for when they're investing, some degree of clarity there, that's where it helps. So the rule of law is critical. Policy making combined with the right implementation of that policy so you can get recourse as an investor requires the partnership of policymakers and the legal system in a country. And I think that's kind of what this can really be helpful to. In a way, you know, ICSID plays some of that role because of providing the ability to, if you get into a dispute with the sovereign, the ability to try and find a way to have a settlement there. Uh, there are similar bodies that do it with two private sector parties that get into disputes, like my old association with the International Chamber of Commerce. But you need to be able to find a way for investors to feel that they have a sense of being able to address a challenge on what they were told they could take as the terms of a transaction when they enter. And I think that's where the rule of law becomes really important. It's very reassuring to them. I do not believe that you can live in a fool's paradise and hope somehow that this will all change in every country in the world. It's not, it's not going to happen. Even policies don't change in every country in the world. It's a very long, hard slog. <laughs> I do believe that our knowledge bank and our legal team can be good partners for the other MDBs and the private sector in how we approach this challenge across countries because of bringing forward what kind of experiences we have where the right policies and the right legal structure can lead to increases in investment from the private sector in certain kinds of, of uh, areas. Along with this, by the way, is the aspect of not every investment has to come from overseas. If you can build and develop local capital markets and local and domestic resources in the right way, that can be very helpful as well in creating the right investment atmosphere. Again, that requires policy and the rule of law to operate. So it's not just overseas investors we're discussing. It's also domestic capital markets, domestic investments, and domestic resource mobilization, all of which are facilitated by this partnership of policy and law. Great. And Ajay, you've been really generous with your time, but I have to ask you one last question. I, I mean, I feel both the urgency as well as the optimism in, in, in what you've, you've said. So I, I just want to, to give you the opportunity to share as you close uh, today, what gives you hope? And how, why should we feel hopeful? I have two sources of hope. One has to do with the people at the bank where I work. I believe that if you want to get development done, you need subject matter experts with the kind of experiences in complicated, difficult geographies that many people in this institution have had. I never cease to be amazed when I travel and meet even young people in the institution with their knowledge, their dedication, and their set of experiences that have brought them to the institution. That's an invaluable asset. It's a very important arrow in your quiver. And I believe that if you don't have the right teams, you can't succeed in such a difficult task. So that's one set of optimism. And the credibility of the bank to me that everybody talks about our convening power and so on is all connected to how well we enable these people to execute and do what they're capable of doing. Hence the need for the efficiency and effectiveness. Our people have to be allowed to do what they're capable of doing. The second part of my optimism has to do with, with the audience we're dealing with out there in the countries, and that's young people. As I started out by saying that young people are a large proportion in the global south, I believe that it is their optimism, their dynamism, their desire for improvement, their hyper-connectivity, technology is enabling some of that, technology harnessed the right way can be the biggest asset multiplier for young people. So that to me, this, this young people technology combination is my second big source of optimism. And I'm kind of hoping that these two things together make a magic mantra. 
Brilliant. And we do have some young people here, some law students who also are attending this. So I hope they do feel that your, your heart for, for young people. Um, Ajay, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation uh, on unlocking private finance, on, on just the challenges, but the opportunities and the reasons for hope that we, we have. You've really given us a lot to think about over the next few days that we have together here. And uh, again, I just want to thank you for joining us and I wish you a safe and productive trip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining. Bye-bye. to um, joining with Chris and Stefan on stage uh, to unpack Ajay's insightful and helpful comments for, and all it means for the agenda ahead. Well, thank you, Ajay, and thank you, Sheila. Um, it's a fascinating conversation. I uh, want to encourage everybody to uh, follow us in social media and use the hashtag LJDWeek2023 and post your comments uh, and questions. So, um, uh, you know, Sheila, as Sheila said, Ajay um, made several essential points about uh, uh, unlocking finance for the future. Um, so Chris, the World Bank Vice Presidency for a uh, legal vice presidency is working across a, a wide range of um, areas to advance the role of law in development. How does the World Bank um, determine which programs are needed in which countries? And how are, um, would the bank determine which law reforms are needed in those countries? Well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, hello again, everyone. I, I think to that point, it's very important to underscore that the World Bank doesn't determine, that we are country-led in our um, development agenda, and it's very important that the country identify for itself its development agenda and the priorities in which it pursues that agenda, and then we determine through dialogue with them what ways in which we can help them uh, establish priorities, what ways we can engage, what are the roles for the bank, other uh, multilaterals, do uh, domestic resource mobilization, and the rest. For our part, we have to work through the Country Management Unit, or CMU, in the context of the Regional Vice Presidency, because they're the ones who are on the ground and have that dialogue and are charged with the responsibility of being most familiar with the needs of the country and their priorities. And so they work together, supported by uh, the Equitable Growth and Finance Institutions Group, Global Practices, uh, Development Economics, and of course the lawyers and others in the bank to help make sure that we deliver uh, that support to them. And, and as we're suggesting now, better coordination and collaboration with development partners. Yes, and I, I appreciated Ajay mentioning that as well, um, that uh, the MDBs and private sector can partner with um, your, your vice presidency. So how specifically um, do or would lawyers advance the development um, agenda in the way Ajay noted? All right, well, I think there's an expansive role for lawyers. Obviously, we have the traditional role of making sure that our uh, programming and the uh, uh, operations that we initiate comply with the articles and the rules and the country partnership framework. But increasingly, I think lawyers are perceived to have that range of experience. It may be the only department in these institutions that's engaged in the full arc of a project from its inception and concept, its embodiment and country partnership framework, uh, through implementation, disbursements, uh, monitoring, uh, compliance, post-disbursement, and problems when they arise. And that gives us a perspective uh, and, and an accumulation of knowledge that I think we can usefully deploy in, uh, in moving the agenda forward in programming generally and in other projects. Um, but most importantly, I think lawyers can be involved in some of the law reforms work that strengthen institutions to mitigate risks and to advance the development agenda. They can be involved in capacity building, both among government officials, government lawyers, regulators, and judiciaries, and in the creation of model laws uh, or law reforms. We're working on some model law reforms. One is the Model Forest Act initiative led by Justice Antonio Benjamin in Brazil and organized by the Asian Development Bank with UNDP and others to try to design a Model Forest Act that would set out 
the best way to preserve and manage uh, forests, which are an essential component to managing carbon sinks and, uh, and, and otherwise uh, uh, preserving uh, forests for future generations in the face of the threat of, of massive deforestation. And yet the continuing need for merchants to continue to use the forest as they have for thousands of years. And so there's that sensitive balance. And lawyers can do surveys and find out what are the trends and what are the uh, uh, successes and try to bring that knowledge together, together with partners to put out a model act. And we can do that in gender, in agriculture. Uh, the energy transition not only has to be an, an energy transition, but it has to be a just energy transition because uh, the transition can obviously be very disruptive to people and we need to make sure that their lives and the impact on them is, uh, is looked after, regulated, and then managed appropriately and fairly. So there's almost an infinite capacity for uh, lawyers' engagement in, in the development agenda. Sure, I would like to bring Sheila into the conversation too in a minute. Um, just, but I wanna know, how can, um, how can you measure success of a law, law reform or capacity building um, with technical assistance or advisory service? Well, it's tough because as challenging as Ajay just mentioned with respect to traditional operations, infrastructure, energy, agriculture, where we might have a 27-month development timeline and 10 years before we can see and measure impact on the ground, law reforms can be at least as long, um, including where uh, it's not the, the change you're seeking to effect is not just a question of changing the rules and the laws, but changing mindsets. Uh, in the way people have behaved or their cultural approaches to issues, uh, particularly on human capital, uh, gender equality, engagement. It takes a more holistic and, and, and longer timeline to be able to get that done. But we start with um, programs that are supported by sound economic and, and, and evidence-based data analytics so that we have specific goals in mind and design a program, just as we do for operations, that is targeted to achieve specifically identified and measurable outcomes. So that at the end of that, when the project is implemented, we can go back and assess whether or not those outcomes were actually achieved. In part because we're fiduciaries, we're spending other people's money, taxpayers' money, and for you here, uh, it's, it's your money. And we have an obligation to invest it responsibly. And so we have to have measurable outcomes to make sure we're doing the job properly and prudently. Um, and, and, and it's a key now, I think, is the extent to which we can increasingly work with um, um, our knowledge, um, and not just the, the knowledge that Ajay referred to, but the data analytics that I, that, 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 that I mentioned earlier. Um, two important respects is that um, our, da our, our, our data uh, uh, development economics group under our chief economist generates a number of very important reports and diagnoses. One is the country, development, uh, uh, country Climate and Development Report, or CCDRs. So for each country, they're producing a report that analyzes the progress that each company is, uh, country is making towards its own uh, climate development uh, plans and the extent to which it's falling short. And in many cases, the shortfalls are attributable to deficits in regulation, um, inefficiencies in, in, in judicial frameworks or an inadequacy in laws uh, that are hindering their development. And so there's an opportunity for lawyers to come in and provide technical assistance and advisory services to help countries achieve their own uh, country development uh, and country uh, climate development programs. Another example, and there are many, is women business in the law which the uh, uh, Development Economics Group has put out for many years. And this report assesses for every country where it stands across eight key metrics of engaging women in the economy um, and, and the ways in which each country is ranked and any deficits or shortfalls that could be enhanced to improve their ranking through uh, law reforms or the uh, efficacy of the enforcement of laws. It's also a good example of the changing of mindsets Every country who's a member of the World Bank Group um, has a, uh, appoints a principal liaison to the bank. And for most countries, it's the Minister of Finance. And the Minister of Finance has an enormous task and many, many uh, things on her agenda. She's got agriculture and infrastructure, energy, 
uh, health care, education. How do you elevate the need for investment of human capital, the achievement of the engagement of women in the economy? Beyond the moral and, and human rights uh, drivers, it's helpful to have an economic imperative to give a more granular sense of the benefits to the economy and job creation by engaging uh, women in the economy. So that's just a couple of examples of the way in which not only lawyers can uh, engage, but working with other departments in the CMUs and the vice presidencies, development, economics, and global practices, and partners. Sure, and um, the CCDRs are really important, and the Women, Business, and the Law is a very, uh, not only informative report, but uh, very important to our work. Um, Sheila, I just, you're the deputy DGC for um, operations. Do you have any reflections on uh, how we measure su the success of law reforms and capacity building? Anything you want to add to what Chris said? Sure. I mean, Chris has covered it very well. And, and we struggle, we've struggled over the years as uh, uh, development practitioners to try and uh, demonstrate the impact that uh, legal and judicial reform projects um, bring. And, um, and a lot has to do with data, uh, but a lot also has to do with power structures in, in countries, right? And, and I think that's where partnerships are very, very critical here. Uh, you know, a, a roads project, people see the road. A judicial project, if they, they'll see the court and they'll be happy, but the impact that it has on the lives of that young woman uh, or, or that girl is, is, is not as obvious. And so we really have to shift the way we think about measuring results when it comes to um, legal and judicial reform projects. And, and we want to do that together in partnership with not just our colleagues within the bank group who, who do this work on a daily basis, but also with legal teams across the world. And I'm also eager to hear how they're doing this. Because when you don't have results, then the next project is not guaranteed and the Minister of Finance is impatient and doesn't think this is something that that is um, uh, is worth doing. But Stefan, it really leads us to this whole um, issue about systems versus projects. And, and I think that's really, really critical. We've typically been institutions that go in to do projects and, and, and come out, so measure the results of a project and leave. Uh, but take, for instance, the environment and social uh, sector. Uh, we are shifting from doing environment and social safeguards in a project to really looking up at a country's systems holistically and um, looking at, at, the, at the laws, looking at the implementation, and then looking at the results. I think that's how we've got to, to, to shift the mindset of, uh, of all of us to, to think about law reform and, and, and how we make impact in countries. So a lot of this seems to relate to ENS. So Chris, I'll come back to you. How, how uh, has the role of environmental uh, and social safeguards evolved? Well, I think as Sheila described, you know, in the 80s and 90s, for those of you old enough to, or, or not embarrassed enough to, uh, to remember <laughs> how long you've been around, um, the environmental and social standards were often seen to be burdensome requirements imposed by lenders like the multilateral organizations in projects. A very a, a good reason back then why many of our private sector uh, legal counsel were advising their clients to avoid institutions like this. Um, but they were very project specific. If you wanted to borrow from an MDB, you would have to comply with their environmental and social standards. And, and to that extent, those standards would be applied in that project. As, as she Sheila mentioned, better yet, if we can extend and expand the application of higher and better environmental and social uh, standards across the country so that they're applying them uh, universally and, and ultimately perhaps even embedded in their legal framework for general applicability. And so we're working with other uh, development partners uh, um, and have been for many years to try to see how we can do that. One of the problems that we create though is be, because we, there's an absence of harmonization or even uh, insufficient coordination that the poor borrower is trying to deal with different standards from different institutions um, and at the same time suffering from limited capacity. So the borrower can't really perceive where and how these differences arise because they may look very similar from the borrower's perspective. 
but yet the borrower's got two sets of compliance requirements, two sets of reporting requirements, and we're making the borrower's life very difficult. And yet harmonization hasn't been uh, successful um, uh, largely across the board. So there's a lot more we can do to make this more effective. Um, and so that, I think, is going to be the future, is how we can get together and, and try to determine some set of a more harmonization, and not just environmental and social, but in procurement, anti-corruption, and other standards, particularly as the, 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 the uh, 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 countries suffer some of the urgencies they have. We need to get the money out there. We need to work together. But working together doesn't mean delivering more inconsistent and, and, and burdensome requirements on clients. So, um, Sheila and Chris, how specifically would the World Bank work um, with development partners in these collaborative efforts as Ajay and you have been talking about? Well, you know, I'll let Sheila speak, but my thoughts would be, you know, conferences like these are nice to get together and network and brainstorm and hear lots of nice thoughts from lots of nice and smart people whenever they come up in the agenda, in the latter parts of the agenda. But, <laughs> But, 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 but seriously, to be able to listen to each other and really think about how we can uh, work together and, and, and deliver respective knowledge and systems and expertise uh, more efficiently and therefore more effectively. Because if we bring a confusing set of objectives and requirements to the market, we're going to not only confuse and burden clients, we're going to be working against their own ability to achieve their uh, development agenda and ultimately our own goals. So we have to figure out a way to work together to bring better solutions uh, to clients. And I think part of that is capacity building. We can do capacity building with the government officials, uh, with judiciaries. We can do uh, work with judiciaries to, to further their own. Most of them have strategic agendas and plans about their own efficiencies and effectiveness. We can help with gap analyses and determining what roles in, in facilitating their journey each of us might play. So the partnership part of the theme of this group, I think, is very important. Sheila, what say you? Yeah, so, um, you know, the conferences like this are incredible. And But I want to say also that it doesn't just stop here. As so many of, of uh, the colleagues in the room have been involved with each other in different ways. Some of them have been sort of informal networks of lawyers across MDBs. And this is in incredibly useful. And a shout out to Alifto, which we just joined a, a few months ago, um, bringing together legal practitioners from across our institutions to discuss topics of interest. Um, but we've also worked together, for instance, in the establishment of AIIB and that partnership that we had uh, to al align our policies and procedures to make sure, as Chris says, when we show up in a country, we're not each coming with our thick um, policies, but we actually have a very aligned way of, of working. And we're trying to do that with more and more and more MDBs across the board and not just in specific projects. But talking about the things that happen after LJD week, uh, we also have the Global Forum and Compact and Forum, which is a very useful t tool to keep on bringing people together, um, uh, practitioners around, uh, around the world on specific topics to dive deeper outside this week into um, you know, what needs to shift. And that all will inform then the projects that we do, the operations that we do. And this link between knowledge and lending, I think, just has to be very seamless. And that's what we want to promote. I think that's very important, just to underscore what Sheila said about the value, not only of the lawyers who are in other institutions, but private sector lawyers who might engage through their law societies, through the compact and forum, uh, through the uh, Global Forum on Law, Justice, and Development. These are great organizations to try to harness those energies and knowledge and to work with us to figure out the best way in which we can work together with our contacts and ability to help uh, on the ground uh, defining the direction and the needs, then develop, working with them to develop effective solutions, and then back to the CMU to deliver those into countries. So, Chris, I have a really important question for you. So. How um, specifically and, um, you know, does the law matter for the private sector? Is this an urgent conversation that um, we must be having at this moment? Um, what do you think about that? Sorry, I've just turned my ringer off. I think <laughs> my, my... I was worried about the same thing. <laughs> 
my mother is telling me to speak more clearly. <laughs> I'm sure my mom's probably called three times by now. I think, I think there's a critical role for the, for the link between the, 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 the legal function and the private sector because the private uh, uh, sector needs to be familiar with the, uh, it has to be able to identify the risks and then needs sufficient uh, risk mitigation, as Ajay mentioned, in order to gain the confidence to make investments. In private sector investment, it's all about risks and rewards. It has to have an understanding of what those risks are. It doesn't have to eliminate them but it needs to be able to uh, mitigate them to an acceptable level of residual risk. And then we need to know on the, on the benefit side and the reward side that we have sufficient systems for capital markets, currency repatriation, and then a judiciary and regulatory agencies that are going to enforce all this in a predictable way. Predictability is critical to build investor confidence. And so these legal systems supported by the legal function, I think are critical. To, to engaging uh, the private sector. And that's what we mean by private sector enabling. We have to enable a fr uh, an investor-friendly environment before the private sector can come in and do a proper assessment and invest its capital with some degree of certainty about that risk and the ability to earn a return. So, Sheila, is this an urgent conversation in your mind that needs to happen now? And what are your, your thoughts about it? Absolutely, it's urgent. Um, as Ajay said, you know, these trillions are not going to be found in one place, right? We need the bigger bank, um, but we also need the private sector. And uh, it's really urgent that we as legal practitioners are ahead of this conversation because it all boils down to those uh, agreements, those understandings that, uh, that are reached. And I think the worst thing that can happen for us is that decisions are made at a top level on, on how to partner without the lawyers really figuring out what this actually means in terms of rights and responsibilities and in terms of sort of the history of our organizations and the, and, and where our organizations should go so it, it's critically urgent um, that we have a, that we discuss this now before the conversation goes too far with that you know then we have to try and catch up so I, I just want to to emphasize the urgency of this so I believe you said, Sheila, that there are a lot of uh, general counsels, both at MDBs, but also in the private sector. And I think you mentioned this as well. So I, I have to ask, what are the top two or three, three uh, legal considerations GCs or lawyers working in the private sector must, cons uh, must uh, consider for an investment to be viable or bankable? Um, and how can they work with the World Bank and other MDBs in this endeavor? Sheila, you go first. I'm, I'm happy to go first. I think I'll just reiterate that whole issue of risk and risk sharing. That's, you know, we're going into highly fragile uh, environments. Um, this is where our focus is as an institution. And even in our, in, in our middle income countries, there are high pockets of fragility. We're seeing that now in, in the world right now. The big wars that are being fought are not necessarily in our poorest countries, but also in our middle income countries. And so how to manage their identify the risks not overblow them but also not underplay them and agree on how this risk sharing will happen uh, some of this is going to need mdbs like ours to 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 shoulder some of the risk but there's going to be some risk that needs to be shouldered by the private sector so we have players like miga uh, and i believe aradana should be in the room we have ifc ramit should be in the room and who who are dealing with this on a daily basis and can help us in how we um, how we identify those risks and how we manage them um, across the board. So Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think too, we don't have to work in isolation to bang the old drum. It's, it, there's so many ideas uh, that can, uh, uh, from here in this room and among our development partners that we would be foolish to try to invent the wheel in each institution or in each circumstance. We have to do better job working with each other. And the feedback that we get in the field, quite frankly, is that the World Bank has not always been a, as collaborative and, and effective a partner uh, as it could be. And so we need to change and we need to uh, look more um, um, uh, um, ambitiously and uh, collaboratively at our partners and to try to really draw them out. And for general counsels in private companies who are uh, uh, increasingly trying to uh, encourage their lawyers to get involved in, in community uh, uh, support and, 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 and things of this nature. 
Um, in my experience, lawyers that work on these reform efforts, uh, lawmaking, capacity building, look back on their career and think that these projects were the most rewarding things that they'd worked on in their career. So I would encourage more people to get involved in this kind of work uh, for their own uh, edification and enjoyment. I think it can be uh, inspiring, it's invigorating, and it enables the lawyers to step to the fore and engage directly to bring their skills and knowledge to bear in a really needed and vitally urgent way. So I also want to end on a high note as we bring this session one to a close. So I'm going to ask you first, Chris, and then Sheila. Um, you know, what gives you hope? Um, the needs are massive, the challenges are enormous. Um, what gives you hope that we could hopefully turn a corner? You know, for me, I think it's the energy that we draw from events like this. And I hope that we see this as an opportunity to uh, network with each other, but we really use this opportunity to inspire each other and to create that uh, energy. And I hope too, then when it comes time uh, to adjourn, we don't just go back to our desks and uh, forget what we've heard over these two days until we reconvene next year and say much of the same thing, but that we actually find ways to work together to actually deliver. Because I think achieving some of these results um, is going to just further inspire and energize us. And you get into a virtuous cycle where we'll end up being more effective in, in delivery. And, and really, the world is not in a good state now, and particularly in the developing world. And so this really is the time to step up and shed some of the old concerns we might have about the risks of uh, compromising uh, in collaboration or uh, 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 working in silos or fiefdoms and really focusing on the, the goal of, of delivering. So, Sheila, you have the last word. What gives you hope? I echo everything Chris said, but I want, I want to also add, and drawing on what Ajay said, it really is the people. And, um, you know, the staff that we work with, the staff who are behind the scenes also who put up this conference, it's been a lot of work and, and who work every day, both in the field. We have several lawyers who are based in country offices and, and those who are based in head, head, headquarters at different levels. It's not just Chris, myself, you know, sort of the uh, leadership of, of, of the legal team. It's, it's every single person is contributing blood, sweat, and tears to this mission. And, and that gives me a lot of hope and energy. And again, borrowing from Ajay, it's, it's, it's young people, it's women. And, you know, I've been privileged, as, as has Chris, to visit um, uh, our country offices and visit staff and projects. And you see the impact that is being made on the ground to the lives of, of people. And, and that does also renew our energy. And we come back and we, we wake up every morning knowing that you know, we're working for these people. So thank you for joining us for session one on unlocking private finance for um, the, the future. So um, uh, you know, please join us on the LJD Week uh, 2023 session at 1030. So there'll be a short coffee break. Um, and uh, for the next session titled Financing Energy Transition, Crowding in the Next Generation of Private Investment. So we look forward to seeing you there. So thank you for joining us. Thank you.